Great. Tom, Tom, would you like to make the introductions? Hi, everyone. This is Sephardic World, brought to you by the Sephardic Genealogical Society. As always, we are grateful to our patrons who are with us here on uh, Zoom, and we welcome our viewers on YouTube. And today, we will be in conversation with Mark Ponte. He is best known for his research on slavery and Black Amsterdamers, but that is just part of his work on the history of Amsterdam, early modern Sephardim, Dutch Atlantic Empire, uh, including Brazil, Suriname, and Curaçao. So tonight will today will be a, a conversation that uh, straddles the world. Um, and to start off, I would like to ask Mark, uh, can you tell a little bit about yourself? Uh, where did you grow up? Did it have an influence on your life as a historian later? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Tom, for the introduction. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, well, yes, I, I was born here in uh, in the Netherlands and and uh, well lived in different uh, different towns. And then uh, at at the age of fifteen, me and my family uh, moved to Suriname, and I think that was a major um, uh, well change in my life, uh, and and would affect also, of course, uh, my career later as a historian. And after after living there for a couple of years, I. I came back to Amsterdam or moved to Amsterdam to uh, to study history and um, uh, at the University of Amsterdam and uh, well yeah that's that's where it all of course started as a historian but yeah who were your professors and who did inspire you the most um well, of course, you've seen I've seen a lot of professors in the time. I have to say that when I was so now I'm clearly an early modernist and doing uh, most of the time 17th century and 18th century research, but mostly 17th century. But while I was studying, I was more interested in in uh, 19th and 20th century history. Um, and there were a couple of uh, uh, professors, and one most notably was um, Evelyn Gans. Um, who was a professor of Jewish, Jewish history and anti-Semitism at the University of Amsterdam and also uh, uh, did a very, yeah, we spoke on, on, the, on the Facebook group about her last, last week, I think, mm -hmm. um, 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 did a lot of research on um, Jaap and Isra Meijer uh, to, uh, uh, well, Jaap Meijer was a, a historian and Isra, a famous uh, journalist here in Amsterdam. And um, they also had a history in Suriname. And um, this, I think we had, well, we just had like a, a uh, she did a whole series on, on the history of, of Jaap and Isra. And this influenced me a lot. Of course, I already had the background in Suriname, and it again reminded me uh, of of, yeah, of of Surinamese history and and the the uh, relations uh, with Amsterdam. And secondly, another professor was um, Johannes Houwink ten Kate, um, who was also working at the uh, uh, Center of Holocaust and Genocide Studies in uh, Amsterdam. And he was actually my uh, uh, my professor uh, uh, when I did my uh, thesis. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, so actually quite a lot changed since then, uh, fifteen years ago, because then I was working on uh, on on new history, so to say, twentieth century, and, and now I'm working on the seventeenth century. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the most famous century in uh, Dutch history. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I other centuries suffered because of that. <laughs> uh, I know that you worked at the Maurits House. The Maurits House is a museum in The Hague. And it was a house built by Johan Maurits of Nassau Ziegen. Uh, what can you tell us about him? Uh, what can you tell us about the kind of job you had at the Maurits? Yeah. 
Um, yeah, let's, let's maybe start with with uh, uh, what I did at the Maurits House. So it's actually, um, well, like like uh, every museum um, now nowadays, uh, um, people are looking uh, and museum uh, personnel is looking at their collections and the the name givers, etc. On on how they what they did in 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 history and uh, the Maurits House is a very clear example of of a museum with a yeah very uh, colonial um, history. So what I actually did there, I was part of a research group, it, a research of consisting of four fellows, research fellows that um, actually is looking into Maurits relationship and. And Dutch relationship with Brazil in the early modern times and during the time of uh, Johan Maurits. And Johan Maurits was, uh, yeah, a, a, let's say a, a family member of the of the Oranges, the princes, and later, of course, the uh, the uh, uh, a royal family. Um, he was not uh, very closely related. He was a nephew or something. Uh, and he went in uh, 1637 to brazil as to become the governor in 1630 the dutch had conquered pernambuco uh the rich sugar uh capitana of brazil as you all know of course um and in, in 1637 uh, Johan maurits was sent there by the wic to become a governor and he's of course very famous for bringing scientists artist uh, Frans Post and, and uh, Albert uh, Eckhout um, with him to to Brazil and and the, uh, which was a very important uh, uh, time for the Dutch because it was the first time that they had one of these sugar colonies in the Americas um, in their hands um, but of course it was also the first period that the Dutch started participating in transatlantic slavery and um Johan Maurits was uh, a very important figure in that that's one side of him of course it, uh, or the you have the art side but also yeah we know him of course as a as a governor that gave uh, more or less uh, or a lot of religious freedom inside the colony um for uh, uh Jews and also for Catholics Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, of course, how he is remembered. But yeah. at the same time, he was also uh, 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 an enslaver and, and 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 somebody that was smuggling uh, enslaved people for his own uh, account. Uh, also living as a, as sort of a royal royalty in in uh, Brazil. He had a, he, he built uh, two big palaces where he had a large garden where all the scientists could come together and and the uh, painters. Um, and this is, of course, the traditional view of him. And now, uh, yeah, the last, let's say, the last 10 years, more interest is also in the more, the darker side of uh, of uh, Johan Maurits and the history of Dutch Brazil. Mm -hmm. And this, this project was part of that. Um, actually, I wasn't really looking into the figure of Johan Maurits, but more looking um, at how uh the period of dutch brazil um uh, was important in the in the history of slavery but also um as well and i've talked about this in this uh series before um in my research into black uh amsterdam in the 17th century i found out that a lot of the people black people that lived in amsterdam had a history in dutch brazil so what I wanted to do in the um, and my article still has to be published, but it's basically about tracing back the the history of these people back to uh, from Amsterdam to Dutch Brazil. And are you succeeding in that? It would be difficult uh, to find data about uh, slaves. Yeah, it's it's very difficult, especially. Uh, if you work, but um, yeah, well, especially enslaved people that are working on plantation, etc. But uh, um, it's it's different for like household personnel, and most of the black people that came enslaved in Amsterdam 
were household personnel and of course sailors and these are th these people are in, in in a different situation than let's say 99 percent of the people that were enslaved in in dutch brazil because they were close to uh the colonizers um uh, we know their names uh or sometimes we know some names but at least more than we have for uh for uh the large majority of people and of course here again also there's uh lots of connections to the sephardic history and the sephardic yeah. uh uh people that arrived from brazil to amsterdam and many of them brought um enslaved uh servants with them but also mixed race family members as we mm -hmm. uh, discussed earlier in the other program yeah is it difficult to trace uh, where the jews came from in brazil and where they went to they came in let's say in installments from 1630 to perhaps 1650 and they left all at once in 1654 do we know where they came from and where they went to uh well i think that it's a very diverse group actually uh um but one of the i think for me is the, the most important group that the well you there's a lot of discussion, of course, about people uh, that went from Amsterdam to Brazil um, in the 30s. Um, but I think a lot of them were already in Brazil uh, and actually um, um, converted in the time uh, um, the Dutch were occupying Brazil because mm -hmm. of the, the religious freedom over there. And... Um, um this of course was um very important in in the years after so already from 6030 you see um um conversos living in brazil coming to amsterdam and also staying in amsterdam mm -hmm. and uh, uh but of course you had like 20 years of people moving from amsterdam from europe back to brazil and from Brazil to Europe, um, mm -hmm. constantly you know, bringing people with them, um, both for uh, uh, merchant reasons, of course, but also religious sometimes. Um, you have been back to Suriname, most of in relation to your research or on holiday or? Yeah. Mm. Well, uh, yeah, I've, so I, when I lived there, it was in the 90s. Um, and I, well, I, I, I go, I went back a couple of times since then. Now, 25 years that I live here in Amsterdam, I think. Um, um, and last time, for the first time, actually for work, um, doing research. I've um, So I've been working for uh, different organizations, different uh, museums in the last year. So my, basically I've worked... We didn't we didn't I didn't even tell this before, but my main job is at the city archives of Amsterdam. Um, but next to that, I was always a part timer there. I do um, um, research for other museums. So in, I did research for the uh, Rembrandt House Museum for an exhibition a couple of years ago. And this year I made a or last year I made an exhibition from the for the city museum in Alkmaar. Uh, about a plantation called Alkmaar um, and that was the main reason that I went to Suriname last year uh, but of course I also uh, took the opportunity to do some other research and um, one of the things I did was um, going with uh, a journalist of uh, the uh, newspaper uh, NRC Handelsblad um, to uh, Jode Savanne in Suriname to mm -hmm. see Oh well, of course, how how it was, how it is there at the moment, but also because there's a lot of uh, archaeological uh, research going on there, and it was very interesting to see. There's a a group of young archaeologists working there. Of course, I don't. Um, um, the Surinamese government is trying to get uh, a, a UNESCO status for. Um, 
uh, Joden Savanne. Um, and that's why there are uh, uh, some funds now for research also. And um, it's very good to see that um, it's taken more serious, let's say, uh, also archaeological research. Um, and um, there's this, there are uh, a couple of young researchers, they're working on some houses over there and doing very interesting stuff. And hopefully mm -hmm. they will publish, uh, publish soon about this. Yeah. Are there sources in Suriname that we don't, that we cannot consult in the Netherlands? Um, there are, I, uh, but there's also good news because there's uh, more and more sources now in Suriname are getting, uh, are, are, uh, are becoming available. Recently, uh, for example, the Burgerlijke Stand of Suriname uh, became completely available um, with scans, mm -hmm. um, which basically has, of course, the whole uh, Sephardic community of the 19th and early 20th century in there, mm -hmm. um, which makes research a lot easier than it was uh, until a couple of weeks ago when you really had to go... Uh, uh, well, I think you, there were there were some options, but nowadays so and um, but there still is, of course, a lot of archives post, let's say, eighteen thirty that still needs to to be digitized and 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 uh, will have a lot of uh, information. Um, mm -hmm. The the situation of the archives is quite bad, I must say. There, it's also they the even though they have uh, a better building than they had 25 years ago, but still uh, um, a lot, yeah, a lot of the archives are are, are, are in, in bad shape. Uh, I think, and, but I think also what I heard, but I, I'm, I don't know for sure that also the, uh, um, the uh, synagogue, itself also has some records still there but i haven't seen them and i don't know of which community they are actually mm -hmm. um, but i think there is still a lot of archives uh to look into and i'm happy that we now also in this, the city archive uh just uh, made a, a let's say a MOU with the archives over there. We're working together also in, in doing some um, uh, HDR projects, making presentations together, and hopefully, well, in future, we can mm -hmm. also also uh, do some more on this. You mentioned privately to me uh, a source that seems to me very important. Uh, the census of Suriname of 1809. And surprisingly, that one is kept in uh, the National Archives of uh, Great Britain. Yeah. Did that you yeah. end up there? Uh, well, that's uh, actually a funny story. It was a census, uh, a British census, actually, because um, um, from the time that, uh, that uh, the, the Netherlands was uh, occupied by the French, and this was, of course, the, the let's say, revolutionary times. Um, the colonies were uh, 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 occupied by the English, and mm. among them was Suriname, and of course also the, the other Guyana Guyanese uh, uh, colonies. The, the the later ones weren't given back. Suriname was given back, so to say, in 1815. Uh, but for, uh, uh, let's say, 15 years, it was uh, in English hands and a lot of English went there also and started uh, working on plantations, uh, also new plantations. And one of the very uh, good things, so to say, is that they wanted to know who was actually living in this uh, colony. And uh, so they there is a census, was a census made, was in, um, I think, between 18, 9 and 11. And um, as far as I know, it was uh, a very complete census of at least of the white and the uh, mixed race population. The free population of Suriname is completely in there. Mm -hmm. And it's, of course, a very important genealogical source also if you want to know, well, who was living in the early 19th century in Suriname. 
and it would be very interesting to well to i know in suriname they have a a, a very poor digital copy copy of this uh uh census uh, documents but it would be very nice and i don't um to have like a, a let's say a modern a digital version of this and make an index on it i don't yeah that will be very nice and very important yeah uh, to have one moment in time where you have all uh, all the data available that will be a nice starting point for genealogy and that would also uh, deliver uh, uh, results for uh, demographic studies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, if someone in the public uh, has an inclination to go to Kew Gardens and uh, to digitize it all, you're very welcome. I think it's it it it, it must be about uh, ten thousand people in there, so it's not it, it cannot be that many uh, scans actually. Mm -hmm. The free population was about ten. 11,000, I think. So it, okay. it should, yeah. Uh, David Mendoza helpfully put a link <coughs> to the uh, archival resource in chat. Uh, you talk, when you talk about uh, Suriname, of course, you talk about slavery also in connection to Jews. Uh, why is the story about Jews and slavery so fascinating on the one hand and so controversial at the same time? Yeah, <laughs> well, actually, yeah, of course, all slavery history is uh, is controversial. Um, um, and I don't think this is special for for Jewish and, and well, of course, there's a sort certain myth and uh, uh, not only in Suriname, it's not even that that uh, uh, of prevailing in Suriname, but it, in a lot of places that uh, it was actually Jewish people that were the most important slave traders. Of course, um, um, there's uh, done a lot of research that has debunked this myth, uh, this myth but still, it's still around. I remember... Um, in Brazil, I was in Brazil, traveling in Brazil. And actually, I had a, quite a, a nice chat with uh, uh, with somebody in a bus in the back, and we were just talking about uh, about history. And then all of a sudden, uh, this guy said, "Yeah, well, but, yeah, but slavery." And then he was talking about Brazil. This was all uh, done by Jews. Mm. Um, so it's it's a very let's say sensitive. Uh, topic. There's a lot of myths about it, but of course we know that, uh, for example, uh, in Amsterdam, uh, um, uh, a lot of uh, merchants that were involved in transatlantic uh, uh, trade were also uh, investing in uh, slave trading. Uh, and um, there was an, quite an interesting article a couple of years ago by uh, Katja Antunes. Who, uh, who actually, um, they were um, reviewing the 17th century sources on slave trading. And actually, partly, maybe they debunked the story, but still it is true that, uh, uh, so it, it was not, not most of the slave trade was done by Jews, but they had an uh, important role in there. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Yeah, what your question was more why it. Uh, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I, I know this. Phrase the question. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, uh, anyway. uh, let's move on to uh, King, our King William Alexander. He's in uh, on Telus right now. And um, he was asked to make apologies for the institution of slavery. And he was asked to do so on Katie Koti, which is the Dutch national uh, celebration of uh, of the freeing of the slaves on the 1st of July, I believe somewhere in the 1860s. 1863, yeah. Uh, what do you think? Uh, should he uh, deliver those apologies 
Well, <laughs> that's a good question. Of course, uh, our Prime Minister Rutte uh, uh, um, already apologized uh, last December, uh, out of quite uh, unexpectedly, actually. Um, and uh, almost at the same time, the King or the Royal Family also announced that they would start uh, or they ask some historians to uh, um, uh, yeah to 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 investigate their role in slavery and colonialism and mm. I think um, and this will be a, a three years program I think mm -hmm. um, which is of course well um, if you look at from a, a distance it, it it's completely clear of course that uh, that that uh, the uh, royal family was uh, involved in this uh, uh, but it, it's always good to to really do the research and show also for people that do not know this or uh, um, what their uh, involvement actually was and then I think if you do this research and you wanted to apologize I think it would be better to apologize after the research is done because then you know where you apologize for um, but he, of course, has two roles, and it's his. Um, he's also uh, the the head of state uh, of of the Netherlands, and also of uh, Curaçao and uh, and uh, Aruba. Um, mm -hmm. um, and I can um, well, uh, as they already announced, actually, that he he will be at the commemoration and the festivities uh, on the first of July. And uh, let's see what he will say at that moment. Maybe he will. Um, apologize uh, on behalf of uh, of of the Netherlands and do another apology in in uh, in a couple of years um for their uh let's say personal or family involvement mm -hmm. um which which is uh, of course um uh, also not uh, uh only in in uh in Dutch colonies, actually, because I know that they also also invested in in colonies of other other uh, uh, countries, so to say. So, so it will be interesting, but I'm I'm not gonna say he should or not. I think that everyone should uh, should <laughs> apologize for uh, for uh, uh, or or should think about their own apologies. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh... We've now discussed Brazil, Suriname, the Antilles, and let's go to Amsterdam. Yeah. What was life like in Florianburg and on wow, yeah. the Maestra in the yeah. 17th century for yeah. Sephardic Jews? Yeah, well, yeah, that's of course my uh, my main in interest at the moment, or or um, um, it Floyd, the Florianburg area was. You could say this was the first multicultural neighborhood of the Netherlands, and maybe uh, of uh, um, um, of course, Freiburg uh, was a very Jewish neighborhood, but it was also a very migrant neighborhood. There were migrants from all over the world. There were actually also Jews from all over the world, of course, but there were also uh, uh, non-Jews from all over the world. And uh, this might makes this this area a very interesting area for me as a researcher, but I think also to see how how early modern migration uh, influenced society or a, a city like Amsterdam. Um, um, and also because actually it's such a very small neighborhood. Everything was close to each other. Uh, everyone was living close to each other. Um, uh, uh, Menasseh bin Israel was living across the street from Spinoza. Uh, uh, um, and and in, in that same area, all uh, so Rembrandt was living, uh, uh, um, all famous people that we know, all famous uh, Sephardic people from that area were all living within these few blocks. So it was really, and 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 in between them there were sailors and soldiers from uh, uh, Denmark, Germany. Uh, there were, um, uh, of course, um, uh, people from Africa living there. There were Spanish. There were um, there were um, 
it was religiously uh, very di diverse of course there were protestant catholics uh there were uh, lutherans there were jews there were sephardic jews there were uh, uh ashkenazi jews so it was uh, uh, and then of course a lot of languages so it it, it was really uh let's say a buzzy buzzy neighborhood mm -hmm. with a lot of things happening on the street a lot of uh street uh, uh, uh merchants a lot of uh things going on mm -hmm. uh I noticed that you do a lot of storytelling. Yeah. Rather than say publish statistics uh, and other boring stuff. Uh, is that your natural inclination or is it part of your job description? That well, you publish <laughs> stories? It's it, it's a bit of both actually. Uh, uh, just after my studies, I, I I first worked in in journalism for the for the local uh, uh uh, television actually uh, in Amsterdam, and and I, I I wrote stories for the website, and uh, um, so I yeah I I have been into storytelling. I really love like to see how people live and try to make the best of their life in the circumstances circumstances that we have in 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 a certain period and in this. The middle of the 17th century is one of the periods that I, I most interest uh, in. Of course, um, so I really like a good story, and I, I and I think, well, people love to read uh, nice stories, and they are not so much interested, or let's say, the general public in st uh, uh, population statistics. So, um, uh, but then again, I'm also very lucky with the sources that I have have available in Amsterdam, of course. Because um, not only do we have, uh, if we talk about Sephardic history, the community records of the uh, uh, Portuguese Jewish community, um, but we have the marriage bands that shows us who married who, and, and they are complete from the late 16th century onwards till 1811. We know exactly who married who and uh, um, who were the... Uh, 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 their family members, um, the the witnesses, so you can really also really map these people, uh, so to say, and see what connections they had. And then third, of course, we have these massive uh, notarial archives, um, three and a half kilometers. Someone someone calls uh, once called it the the mother of all archives. Uh, because it's so rich in in details about everyday life, not only um, who owned which house or sold uh, uh, tobacco to whom, but also uh, fights that were happening on the street. Uh, uh, of course, last wills that tells us a lot about people, um, not only their family members, but also the people around them. Um, so yeah, I, I, there are so many sources and nowadays with the new techniques, um, um, it's just uh, 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 fantastic w what you can tell and find out about people. And, and this works actually best if you narrow it down to a person or a family or a situation um, in a, a certain area like, uh, like Floyenburg. But of course, mm -hmm. I do not only do Floyenburg, but it's one and and the, and the Jewish area, but it's one of the most fascinating areas because of what we just talked about the the the, mm. the, the mingling of people over there, not um, uh, the the from Armenians and Persians uh, merchants to uh, uh, Turkish, of course, in the mid 17th century, a lot of uh, refugees from Eastern Europe come to uh um to the area and uh that's yeah there are so many stories there to tell about individual people that you yeah you will it's, not be out of work uh, no <laughs> i don't think so not not uh, uh there are so many stories to tell yeah 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 it's a massive project 
of the Amsterdam Setting Archives uh, to digitize all their notarial archives. And not only from the 16th, 17th, 18th century, but also the 19th, early 20th century. It's such a big project that I wonder uh, where do they stand now? Um, and originally, they projected that they needed 10 years to do it all, to digitize it, to index it all. Yeah. We're now five years into the project, I think. Is that so yeah. feasible? Um, yes, and no, no, well, yeah, I think, well, maybe 10 years is a bit, uh, but uh, more than half of it is digitized. So that's uh, that's a good uh, good point. Mm -hmm. We have uh, over 10 million scans. And, and especially if we talk about the early modern period, it's a lot more even. So because almost all of it is done in the early modern period, the 19th century, uh, not so much. And I think uh, in the end, um, there will be a new 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 projects doing the 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 modern period mm -hmm. from uh, 1811 onwards. Um, uh, so far, as I said, there are 10 million scans made, which is more or less half of it. But if we uh, I think two thirds, if we talk about the early modern period um, of these scans, about Two million scans are completely indexed and searchable on names. Um, um, so, uh, well, that's that's uh, quite a lot. I think ten mm. to fifty percent, but still only ten to fifty percent. Mm. But of course, since we have started indexing them, um, also uh, the the new technology HDR made a huge, huge uh, techno technological. Uh, uh, way up and and i think within a couple of years we will have the complete archives at least uh, available in hdr mm -hmm. uh, now we have over half a million scans online in hdr uh, which are completely searchable uh, most of it is quite decent and 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 the 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 models uh, uh, are actually getting better all the time um so i think yes i think within five years from now i think maybe not an index uh but at least um all the notarial archives of the early modern period will be uh, searchable of course maybe some of of the material is uh, is severely damaged by by fire etc that could could uh, 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 and some of it has disappeared. Some of it has is disappeared. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's uh, something else. But I think we are uh, well on the way. But maybe a little bit different than we thought in the beginning. That with we have a, a large group of volunteers helping us doing the indexing. Mm -hmm. But probably in the end, uh, ACR will be first, and then uh, we will have new projects on making also indexes because of mm. course hcr is very nice and you can search a lot but it's also a very very uh much da data that uh that that it's often hard to uh to make an interpretation on so there okay. is it's, when everything's available doesn't say that we know everything um, yeah. my last question uh, before the public gets in uh, what is your role in this project well at the moment so uh in the al amsterdam act uh, mm -hmm. um at, at it, it was more important than it is now actually um uh, but what i mostly did was uh what i always do is look for the nice stories and 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 write uh, articles about that and, and short stories and give presentations also to make well to show how important the archive is but also uh, 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 um, uh, but I also have been doing a lot of well just uh, uh, work in because what uh, how we do it at the moment is that you have like volunteers that are indexing, but of course you need also um, uh, specialists checking whether this is uh, the correct information. 
these specialists can be also volunteers, but there are is also a group inside the archives um, that uh, does this. But uh, my uh, my work is e even going more into the storytelling. So I will be basically working more on uh, exhibitions and uh, and and uh, and and writing uh, new stories than than on writing the, stories, writing a and, book. Yes, of course. Yeah, that's that, that's I I hope to. Uh, well, at least to put all the stories I have in a book, and then a second book, of course, on the uh, the black community and also the relation with the Sephardic community. We are looking country. forward to that, and you are very welcome when you finish the book. I will, I will come again and talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, very early on, David Mendoza has a question, so I'll uh, thank, thank you. Um, as, as I understand, slavery arrived in African slavery arrived in uh, Europe, in uh, Portugal, in uh, Lagos, and I was uh, watching an interview you gave a couple of years ago with the uh, Africa Lenisi uh, YouTube channel. Oh yeah, and if I recall correctly, in that you said that there wasn't slavery in Amsterdam, but then it came. Uh, and so the obvious question was, and I'm remembering what you said earlier, did the slavery in Amsterdam arrive with the Portuguese Jews? Um, yes, I think so, yeah. Um, um, and it's always, when you talk about slavery in Amsterdam or the or Northern, Northern Europe, um, it's always, of course, um, you have the law and then you have the, uh, let's say, practice uh, uh, in the households. Um, and um, in, in, in the cities of, of, uh, of the Netherlands, um, slavery was prohibited already in the, in the Middle Ages. Um, and this was mostly a customary law. And um, um, then when... In the late 16th century, and, and if we talk about Antwerp uh, already in the early 16th century, um, when uh, migrants from uh, Portugal, Spain um, came to the north, some of them brought uh, enslaved servants with them, as they were used uh, to do in uh, Spain and Portugal. And uh, also, if we look at Amsterdam, the same happened actually in in uh, the let's say late 16th especially early 17th century um, um it is for the first time or at least in the sources that uh enslaved people are mentioned and that we see them on uh in, in the records and also uh in the the records of the portuguese jewish community um and later um when the dutch started colonizing of course, they also uh, brought enslaved servants with them from Brazil and also from East uh, India. Uh, but um, if we look at the uh, uh, early 17th century and also with the work I've been doing in this black community, and I recently published an article on uh, in an Amsterdam um, about uh, black women in the 17th century, and uh, um, and this article actually goes uh, uh, is about agency and how they uh, uh, could improve their their situation in 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 Amsterdam. Uh, and and you see, actually, almost all of them are working also after they are freed uh, in Portuguese Jewish households. So um, the 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 seventeenth century uh, history of Black Amsterdamers and Jewish Amsterdamers is 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 completely intertwined. Uh, yeah, the, they just are 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 connected on every level. Um, but having said that, of course, it was not formally uh, uh, allowed, and which gave uh, uh, enslaved people a lot of. Uh, well, they were not formally enslaved anymore, and this gave them opportunity to leave households. And um, it's interesting to see that actually, if you look at the community records also, or if you, for the, the cemetery of Bedheim, only in the beginning 
uh, with the opening of the cemetery, there's a certain uh, it, it's, it's there's a location uh, especially for uh, 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 escravos, um, and later they still use uh, use there still is there are mulattas and negras on the uh, cemetery, but the word uh, escravo of, or escrava isn't hardly used anymore after the the uh, 1620s and the same is true if you look in the notarial archives um in in the early 20s 30s people are still uh called slaves and later they are uh called uh, well by their color actually but uh, um and i think if you look at uh, um uh more or less in the mid 17th century, everyone knew also within the uh, uh, Portuguese Jewish community that slavery was not allowed and that so they weren't, um, um, most of them uh, 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 weren't enslaved anymore. So it was the Portuguese who basically brought slavery into Amsterdam, is that fair or not? Yeah, you can you can say so um, uh, as uh, in the yeah from Spain and Portugal, so yeah, okay. it was them. Ali um, Ergelsoy uh, remarked that the date of the first of July, eighteen sixty-three, when the Dutch abolished slavery, is very late. I believe it's one of the latest country to do so. Is that correct? Uh, yes, for at least for the European countries, yeah. Of course, uh, uh, Brazil was later, but then was already uh, 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 independent. Cuba was also later, but it was also already uh, independent. But for English, French and Dutch, so to say, is where the Dutch were last. Juan mm -hmm. um, Gomez Caceres uh, wants to know the title and the author of the publication about slavery trade that you mentioned, the one it, in which the myth was debunked that it were oh. Jews who... Uh, yeah, I, have, I, I, I can uh, look for it on the, on the fly. <laughs> and I say, well, well, let's say that I will... Uh, uh, um, it was Katja Antunes and... Uh, and it is in a, in a magazine called uh, Tijdschrift voor Sociaal en Economische Geschiedenis. Mm -hmm. um, um, should I look for it now? <laughs> I, can, oh, I can, but or or maybe you can send it later. But um, yeah, okay. it, it is all, uh, available online. Okay, but uh, behind the paywall, I presume. No, no. no? Okay, no. so the TS. E -G .nl. that's the website of the magazine um, and if you look for uh, I think Katja Antunes then you will find this article okay and otherwise I, I, I can send it later of course uh, yeah. if that's uh, convenient um, no more questions there so is there anyone who has a question for Mark? Um, How Howard just uh, posted uh, a, a link in the uh, in the chat on uh, on on Zoom. Um, I, if I'm allowed, I, I have a subsidiary uh, question or another question. Some years ago, I read a book by a Portuguese and British academic. I think the Portuguese name was Horta about uh, Jews in West Africa and sort of Senegambia. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. And we never really heard anything further about that. I just just wanted to know if 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 that's sort of solid research or not. Yes, it is actually, and it was mostly based also on uh, on uh, on notarial records in Amsterdam. I, I think mm -hmm. um, um, so. There was uh, in the in the area that is now Senegal. Yeah. Uh, there was a small Jewish community. Uh, actually, mostly men that uh, married with local African women, um, and some of them 
uh, and this is early 17th century, late 16th. And I, I know that some of them also ended up in uh, in Amsterdam, actually, and also uh, uh, some of the offspring of uh, mixed uh, 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 of mixed African Jewish. Um, yeah, it, well, I think it's a very good book uh, by Horta and someone else. Yes, um, and it's very interesting. Uh, uh, period because there I think they were living with just small groups in 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 villages and uh, they did both research in the notarial archives but also in uh, in the inquisition uh, records in uh, in Portugal I think um, and the inquisition kept a close eye on what was happening over there and a lot of what we know about the, the interracial relations there and also um, that some of the uh, people within this community were already from mixed descent in Portugal, if I remember correctly. For example, a certain uh, uh, Moses Mesquita, the Mesquita, who later became quite an important uh, figure also in Amsterdam, who is, according to uh, at least uh, uh, the, the records of the uh, Inquisition, was of mixed, uh, he's, he's called uh, a, a mulatto, um, and I, uh, I think later on, this is really early 17th century. I think most of them settled actually in Amsterdam in in the 1620s, 1630s. Thank you. Uh, how how would posted the name of the book, the Forgotten Diaspora? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Were Were there any other sort of communities or families? I don't know. Maybe in Angola or somewhere else. I mean, now now obviously there's various. Uh, African um, uh, groups and tribes and and so on that are claiming Jewish ancestry. Do 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 we know of uh, apart from uh, Senegal of any other uh, communities? I I know I don't know of not not in, uh, like that. I, I've only seen certain individuals uh, living in it, but I would suspect that, for example, in Ang Angola would have because uh, 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 and also maybe uh, Cabo Verde of course so more the 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 uh, the islands Santo Mé but especially Cabo Verde uh, uh, had of course uh, uh, a community and also there were many uh, people of mixed descent mm. uh, okay thank, thank thank you but Bernard you have your hand up hello yeah uh, thank you for the the presentation. I'm interested in particular, and I think your work is invaluable, um, in how it feeds into public debate about um, immigration, about the past and slavery, um, about concepts of um, public or national apology um, for past misdeeds. Um, and I just want to give two brief examples. Uh, a couple of days ago on the BBC radio, they had a program in which somebody who had been tracing their ancestry had traced it back to slave owners and slaves. In other words, they were descended from both in Jamaica and um, he talked about how that had made him feel, but then went on to say that um, there was a whole other set of feelings when he discovered that as his slave ancestors were freed, they then went on to buy slaves. Um, and, you know, it, it creates a, a set of cultural, historical, conscious um, or conscience clashes. Um, and the other thing is, I remember purely by chance being in Rotterdam somewhere around 1987, 1988, and went to see a Surinamese feature film called One People. Um, and it was a lovely film, and it celebrated the cultural and ethnic diversity of Suriname, but it also showed the cultural and historical clashes and conflicts, um, and particularly the legacy of 
um, slavery and of European colonialization and imperialism. And I presume that in a, a fairly significant way also fed in to public debate. And last year there was an exhibition in the Jewish Quarter in Amsterdam curated by a cousin of mine, Gideon Querido van Frank, called Zen Yodel Vita, Jews White. And I gather that also caused a lot of um, controversy in public debate. So can you talk about how all of this feeds into the <laughs> yeah. public debate? Oh. Yeah, yeah. So that's a lot of different. It's it's good to 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 tell if we uh, to start with one people. I've seen this movie a lot of time. It's like a sort of a national uh, uh, movie of Suriname, and, uh, and it was made by Pim de la Para, who is of course uh, himself of uh, uh, um, a Surinamese uh, Sephardic uh, uh, or Sephardic Surinamese. Um, and, Which uh, I didn't know when I saw it. <laughs> yeah, but uh, uh, and I think he's of, of mixed, uh, but he's still. Uh, yeah, uh, well, it, it's interesting to know for Suriname, it's especially not so. Suriname is a uh, because um, after slavery, you uh, you had endangered servitude of Asians, first uh, of uh, people from India, and afterwards also from Java, and also people from China. So it's a it's a country with a lot of uh, people from from all over the world, so to say, a very mixed country. It's sort of Floyerberg in, in country uh, uh, yeah. version of it, um, where uh, the uh, where mixing was very important, especially with the white and the African uh, population um, is mixed and there's also um there's a a, a a famous writer who writes historical novels and also other historical story is Cynthia McLeod and um um she writes about Surinamese history and and she also if you st she always says if you start shaking a family tree in Suriname at a certain point always a Jew falls falls out of the tree and uh, a lot of people that are are, are recent researching their uh, their family trees in Suriname and that ha have uh, found out also recently with DNA research uh, have found out that uh, a lot of them um, have uh, white ancestors and especially Jewish ancestors since uh, until early 19th century half of the white population of Suriname was Jewish. Um, um, so uh, and 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 this is also if you if you would look into uh, I don't know if they still have it but in the phone book of of Suriname uh, and you check the names uh, there are uh, many many names that you normally would uh, 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 think of as uh, Sephardic uh, families or uh, um, at least Spanish Portuguese families and in the Surinamese context. Uh, most of them had a had a Sephardic background, um, be, uh, but of completely mixed families who often already in the uh, 19th century or even before um, were uh, uh, were mixed, and 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 many of them um, um, became Christians in the in the 18th and, and 19th century. Um, but there were three. There were many other things that you would. <laughs> yeah, that you would how old yeah, well, the, the thing about are Jews white? This is a very interesting uh, point, I think, because uh, also in recent discussions about identity and identity politics and whether you belong or not belong in a society, um, um, because black and white has always also been uh, a way of of saying. Uh, uh, or at least in, in Europe, so whites are is 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 the majority, and black is the non-majority, and uh, um, and black can mean dark skin, very dark skin, but also darker, and also has of course the some negative uh, uh, connotations, um, and um, partly what we see now and in, in discussions about. Uh, institutional racism and uh and 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 how racism is all 
over society. Um, the same is, of course, true for uh, how uh, uh, how anti-Semitism anti works and how uh, the Jewish people of Amsterdam were seen by non-Jewish uh, people. So I th I think it's it's very closely connected, and and that made this exhibition in 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 the in the Jewish Historical Museum. Uh, very on point, I think, uh, uh, in 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 the in the discussions at the moment. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. Answers. Thanks. Um, I'm just interested. That's a brilliant. Thank you so much. Because I make theatre, I'm very interested because I've I've recorded people's life stories for long periods of time listened and listened and listened to what they say about their lives this is working in working class steel work all sorts of people and i'm wondering if there are any diaries any records of what the arguments were about this stuff as it went on as the different things happened as races etc etc were the communities was there debate discussion and disagreement in the communities and are there any diaries or records of that rather than that historical framework, yes, but the internal arguments and not simply through a, a rabbi or two. Uh, is there stuff about that? Uh, well, well, not not so much, I'm afraid. Of course, there are, are also theatre plays of the 17th and 18th century. Oh, right. What are they called? What are their names? Can you send uh, them? Um, I can send, well... <laughs> And and not not that there are so many. There was one play which I thought was very interesting. It's called um, Zabinaya, and uh, it's actually the only play that had uh, uh, that the title role was uh, uh, this Sab Sabinaya is a is a black woman. How do you uh, spell it? Uh, um, Z, Z A B. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, Z A B Z A B I N A J A, I think. Sabinaya. Sabinaya, right? Thank you. And 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 it play and it's actually the the translation of a Spanish play, and the title role is a uh, 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 a black woman. And what the translators did is that they uh, moved. This play uh, not only did they translate it to Dutch, but they also made it in Floyerberg, so in the Jewish area, and and uh, um, so all the uh, the the, the uh, characters, well, their names are not translated, but the locations are translated to to uh, uh, um, and there you might say that there was a little discussion on on slavery and and uh, um, but also on multiculturalism in in a way um I, I think for early modern times it's very hard to find uh e ego documents uh discussing this kind of uh, things you of course you have sometimes travel accounts there's a very interesting travel account of uh or account of uh, uh, ernst brink who was a burgomaster in uh, the city of Harderwijk. And he has written a lot on all sorts of things, actually, also on what he saw when he traveled through the Netherlands. Uh, but also he had contact with people from Brazil, also with Portuguese Jews who informed him about, uh, uh, um, well, life in Brazil and, and other uh, countries. And um, when he went to the Jode Breestraat, he wrote, he wrote, down just a few cent he went to Amsterdam he just uh, I think he wrote just six sentences about it and one of the sentences was about the Jode Breestraat uh, and he said that in in the Jode Breestraat mostly live uh, Portuguese uh, who are Jews and all of their servants are blacks and Moors it, so it was at least somebody that that discussed this this fact and saw it in and it was an uh, an, an account of the 1620s i think um and there is of course this this letter to spain i, for, I forgot um that also discussed or at least uh yeah discussed life in, in florianburg 
um, I mentioned him the last time, but I now uh, it escaped my mind. But he wrote about 20, 20 or 30 pages on life in Amsterdam. And he also discussed slavery. He, he, this was 1680s. And uh, he was, he said that uh, about slavery, he said that uh, actually, and that's interesting because it's 60 years, 70 years later the, uh, than the first uh, people, uh, Sephardic migrants arrived. He, write, he writes that now uh, that there's no slavery in Amsterdam and that all blacks that come from Brazil and other areas are freed when they arrive in, in the city. And it's... Um, uh, and I think that that was more or less uh, the case in this period. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Bruce, you have thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Um, Mark, I'm I'm fascinated, and and I'm sure you've covered this. How is it that we could have, whether it was Sephardic or Ashkenazi? Um, families celebrating Passover with slavery in the house. A am I am I too 21st century with that question? I mean, is 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 that a an ironic twist yeah. every year that that they just asked uh, the slave to open the door for Elijah? I mean, how did this who noticed this historically? Yeah, it, uh it's these are uh yeah it's it I, these are very diff, difficult questions i think um especially in, in not well if you look at the of course we know the the famous uh, uh print of the uh in amsterdam where you have uh um a black servant but he's at least at the table uh um um uh, during the meal um but the situation for example if you look at at, at the area called uh, had the Yoda Savannah, so the Jewish Savannah in Suriname, where for the first time uh, people had more or less complete religious freedom and and uh, and 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 and, and uh, jurisdiction on most uh, cases, but this was completely based on uh, the the uh, labor um, and 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 lives of 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 enslaved people um, uh, who outnumbered them uh, one to ten which is and and they they went there and they uh, to 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 look for for freedom yeah um it's that's of course it was, I mean, mark was was slavery what we think of slavery or was slavery a a social welfare program or something in between uh well slavery in this in the 70th 80th century was really tough slavery uh where you were uh working for 10 15 years and that that was uh 20 years uh you were lucky to survive that i think and there was no difference there um in in uh, whether uh the the enslavers were uh, christian or jewish or or whatsoever it was just uh a violent exploitation of of uh, human lives, um, and then again, of course, uh, apparently in these times, people, uh, um, well, they thought that this this was something that they uh, were entitled to do. Thank you. Um, David, any questions on? Um, Arnold, Arnold has his. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for the for the talk. It's very interesting. I've seen an advert. For, I've seen an advert in in the book of um, of um, of Laura Lieberman, uh, mm -hmm. which actually has an ad has an advert for from a, a man called Benjamin De Vries, um, who is looking for his slave. It's uh, he, he's offering a reward for the slave. Would would these de Friesis have been Ashkenazim who came from Holland, or would because de Fries is not a Portuguese name? I, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, also in Suriname, like like in uh, in in the Netherlands itself, um, uh, actually the 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 first 
um, Jews that settled there were uh, were uh, Sephard Sephardim, but later also a lot of Ashkenazim went there, yeah, and also yeah. Uh, a lot of them uh, became plantation owners, etc. Actually, not not really in the area where it was uh, Yodus Savannah, but uh, uh, yeah, so a lot of I think. I'm not completely sure, but I I think ar around 1800 um, it was half half more or less. So uh, if you look at the Jewish uh, uh, um, a population of Suriname, so more or less half of the white population of Suriname was Jewish, and half of them was Sephardic. But it could be a little bit. Uh, but yeah, so the the Frises, they came, uh, they were an Ashkenazi uh, family. Um, but of course, there was a lot of, especially in later years, a lot of mixture also between the the two communities. Or yeah, not a lot. Uh, I am I am a product of these these mixes, mm -hmm. um, but which is also why I'm interested in in uh, Recife in uh, in in Brazil. Um, can I can I find names of the people who the, the Sephardi people who uh, went with the Dutch in sixteen in the sixteen fifties and uh, and maybe who left when the Dutch left in the 1650s, so in the 1650s when the Dutch left? Oh, I've never seen like a list of people that uh, went. Of course, you can see if you look at the uh, community records in Amsterdam, uh, in Amsterdam, you can see uh, a lot of people arriving around that time and also earlier um, uh, because yeah. they started, of course, paying finta. Uh, uh, but but some people. Of course, moved on and maybe never became uh, uh, members in Amsterdam. I don't know, um, but there's no no. I've I've never seen a list. Of course, there's there are some. There's for example, but this is about the rich people that were living in in uh, in Brazil. There are lists of people claiming uh, properties that they've lost in Brazil. Oh. and actually, in the there is a new. Uh, biography on yeah you, I don't know you can't, I can't read it, it. But it's a Dutch biography by Erik Odegaard on uh, on uh, Johan Maurits and uh, he was head of research at the uh, Maurits house and one of the uh, very interesting discoveries he he made is because we knew for a long time about the claims. Uh, made by uh, people living uh, or or had that had to to leave Brazil. Yeah. Um, but he found also uh, all the uh, the the complete cases. So now we know what happened with all these claims and and also how much uh, these people claimed. And, oh, wow. uh, okay. Um, so that's that's very interesting. And I think he has not published all of it yet, but there's a lot of uh, information coming on. Having said that, I saw some notarial documents also on the situation in in early 1654 when everybody had to leave, and of course, uh, especially all the people that are uh, openly live, living as Jews, they really had to leave. Otherwise, the Inquisition. Uh, uh would come in and and uh uh i saw some people making statements that uh because everybody had to leave but not everyone was rich of course and especially they could not bring if they were uh or they did have assets they couldn't bring them especially if it was like plantations etc um so all the poor people were actually uh uh, uh, uh how, how do you say uh, for dealt, um, uh, divided put on different boats um, mm -hmm. so that everyone could leave even though they couldn't didn't have any money so all the poor people would be set on uh, on the equally on every boat uh, so, uh, okay but these poor also poor Sephardic people I think many of them are hard to trace in uh, in the archives um there's a uh, one exception uh, in the earliest uh, minute book of Brazil of yeah. the Portuguese Jews. There's a list of uh, signatures. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, the people signing uh, the the askamot of the community. 
Um, is that on the archive? Where, where could I find it's that? On the Amsterdam uh, City Archives and the, and the archives of the Portuguese Jewish community. But I uh, transcribed that list and put it uh, on yeah. the Sephardi diaspora. Somewhere. Yes, I think I've seen it. But okay, thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the. And but I think, you I think those still signatures, and you compare that to signatures from later in Amsterdam. You'll yeah. see that there are a lot of the same people there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Both of you. Okay. Um, David, any questions on um, YouTube or? No, I, th I think all the questions there were sort of answered uh, as we okay. went through. Then I think uh, we've can end this meeting and uh, a big uh, thank you to Mark Ponter who agreed uh, at the last minute to talk with us and uh, he made some very interesting points and there was a lot of discussion uh, was a lot of discussion going on in the chat as well I'm hoping to uh, preserve that um, so thank you to Mark, thank you to our patrons who are with us here, who support us and make all of this possible. Uh, thank you to our viewers on YouTube. And we hope to see you all next week when uh, Adrian Jeanette, and I hope my pronunciation of that name is correct, uh, we will speak next week about the Tao Synagogue uh, in um, New Orleans, which will take us for a trip on the history of that synagogue. So thank you all and hope to see you next week.